Hey there. Okay, so let's continue with chapter nine. Um, and actually this is gonna finish us off for chapter nine as well. And let's discuss molecular spectra. So the energy states of a molecule or the energy of a molecule can actually be divided into four different categories. You've got the energy due to the interaction of the electrons and the nuclei, and that's kind of what we've been covering so far with the Bohr model of the atom and the quantum mechanical energy levels there. You've got your translational energy, so if you have a free molecule, for example, it can be zipping around in all dimensions due to the temperature, so that's another form of energy. If you have a molecule that um, is an extended molecule and not just one atom, then it can rotate. It's going to rotate about its center of mass. And then if there's a bond and it's more than one atom again, then it can vibrate also about the center of mass. So the total energy of the molecule is the sum of all of those, the translational, the electronic, the rotational, and the vibrational. But if you were to take a spectrum of the molecule, basically um, all you would get would be the rotational and the vibrational um, if you look at a certain energy range. The electronic um, energy structure might be in the X-ray range to the optical range to the UV range. Somewhere in there it's going to be a little higher energy. Um, and if you look in a different regime, then you're going to be seeing the uh, tr uh, rotational and the vibrational and that'll be a lower energy um, in the microwave uh, region, um, so on and so forth. Okay, so we're gonna look at the spectrum that you can get from the rotational and the vibrational energy levels. Um, there's a lot of important work that goes on there that can help you identify um, what type of molecule it is. So it gets used a lot in physics. Okay, so let's talk about the rotational motion of the molecules first. We're going to um, model everything after a diatomic model in this lecture, but all the ideas that we lay out for a diatomic could be extended. It's just more complex. Um, maybe you would even need a computer to simulate it if you get a molecule like DNA or something huge like that. You would even need a computer. Um, so let's just talk about the diatomic molecule or a two-atom molecule, and that'll be the simplest possible case. All right. So in that case, you um, are going to work with your three-dimensional Cartesian system. You're going to place one of your axes. In this case, I chose the x-axis. And that'll be the axis along the bond between the two um, atoms. And then what you can see is that um, you've got two degrees of freedom for your rotation. Um, if an atom is sitting there spinning on its own axis, like it would be if it rotated around the x-axis, you're not going to be able to tell, okay, for all intents and purposes. It's a point um, particle, so the rotational about the x-axis is unimportant. And that just leaves it to rotate about the y-axis and the z-axis, okay? Okay, so going back to first semester of physics, you can define a rotational kinetic energy. And the rotational kinetic energy is equal to one-half I omega squared, where I is the moment of inertia of the molecule, and omega is the angular frequency, okay? This is also equal to the angular momentum squared over two times the moment of inertia. Okay, you can do that simple proof if you just remember that for an extended body, L is equal to I omega. Okay, now we've just got a diatomic molecule, so we can use the reduced mass of the system. Um, this is something that we covered in Modern 1 and also gets covered in Introductory Physics. If you need to ref uh, refresh on this, you can you know, go back and, and look at those introductory textbooks. I'm just going to assume that you understand reduced mass. So reduced mass here um, is the product of the two masses, m1 times m2, divided by their sum, m1 plus m2. Here I'm going to define REQ as the equilibrium bond length, and then we can define our moment of inertia as I is equal to m REQ squared, okay? Now, as I said, classically, the value of the molecule's angular momentum can be continuous. It can have any value of omega, and then your angular momentum is L is equal to I omega. But we've already learned that in quantum mechanics, things aren't that simple, okay? And so when you shrink down to the size of a molecule, you're definitely in quantum mechanical world, and you have to consider the quantization of the angular momentum. For a molecule, the angular momentum is quantized in the same way as other forms of angular momentum. 
I'm going to use J as your rotational quantum number. Now your book uses L again, but I think that's confusing. So I'm going to stick with J in my notes and just understand that your book does it slightly differently. So the magnitude of the angular momentum for the molecule for its rotation is L is equal to the square root of J times J plus 1 and then times H bar, Planck's constants divided by 2 pi. Now J is an integer that starts at 0 and goes up in integer steps from there. Okay. So if we plug into our little formula of L squared over 2 times I and that gives us our rotational kinetic energy values for the um, for the system, then we have E rotational is equal to H bar squared over 2I J times J plus 1. Okay. So you can see that here the rotational kinetic energy is quantized. It depends on the moment of inertia. And you can also notice the pattern that as J increases, your states are going to come farther and farther apart. That's shown here on this slide where you start with J and then go up J equal to 1 and so on and so forth from there. And you can see what the spacing would look like. It starts off close and gets further and further apart as J gets bigger. Now, you're going to follow the selection rule, um, and again, this can get violated sometimes for conservation of angular momentum, but most of the time it holds. The selection rule is that J can change by at most 1, plus or minus 1. So the transitions are only going to be between adjacent levels. And that means that the energy of your photon, if you take the differences in between those um, energy levels, you're going to get that your photon's energy is going to equal to h bar squared over i times J. Okay? So that's what we've got for the photons that come off any energy level transitions between the rotational energy levels. All right. Now, that's one thing that appears in the molecular spectra. The other is the vibrational uh, motion of the molecules. So let's cover that. A molecule you can kind of model as two little balls that are hooked up by a spring. Now, of course, there's not really a spring, but if you think about it, a bond acts much like a spring. And this is one of those reasons that we harp on the simple harmonic oscillator so much in physics, because it's such a nice model system for a lot of different things. To remind you of some of the stuff from the simple harmonic oscillator, if you've forgotten, remember that Hooke's law says that f is equal to minus kx, okay, where k is our spring constant, or the stiffness of the spring. And so we're going to use here k as the stiffness or strength of our bond. Now the potential energy for the system of uh, elastic potential energy is one half kx squared. So um, that's pictured here, and it's parabolic in shape. So if you look um, and remember some of the plots that we had for what Bond's um, energies were that took this basic shape where it approached the asymptote on one side and then decayed off to zero on the other. Now if you zoom in and look right around R0, which is the equilibrium position, you can see that it does look vaguely parabolic as long as you don't get too far away from R0. And so the idea of using the simple harmonic oscillator as a model system isn't so crazy for this system. All right, now to remind you, if you have two masses hooked up to a spring and they're vibrating like this, that's a different kind of thing than if you have a wall or you're suspending it from a ceiling and you pull one mass down and let it vibrate. Okay? In that case, we're going to use the center of mass of the system. The center of mass of the system will remain the fixed point, and then your masses will oscillate um, kind of around their equilibrium positions with respect to the center of mass. If we do it that way, then again, we can use the reduced mass of the system, m1, m2 over m1 plus m2, um, and stick that into our formula. Okay. Now, it turns out for the classical harmonic oscillator that the angular frequency omega is equal to 2 pi times the regular old frequency, or the number of oscillations per second, f. And then that is equal to the square root of the spring constant k divided by the reduced mass here for this two mass system. Okay, so this is the equation that we're going to use. This is all classical. So classical mechanics can describe the relationship between the frequency of vibration and the properties of the system like the spring constant and the reduced mass and all that kind of stuff. What quantum mechanics does is predict that this molecule is going to vibrate in quantized states. Okay, So the, um, the energy, the allowed energies 
are going to follow this equation. E sub n is equal to n plus one half h bar omega, which is equal to n plus one half hf, okay? This is what you get if you plug that one half kx squared as your energy in your potential energy into the Schrodinger equation and then solve for the available energy levels. This is the equation that falls out. We actually covered this in modern one, if you remember. And if you don't, you can look back and review all that stuff, okay? Now, you notice that if n is equal to zero, that's considered the ground state, okay? So here, the ground state energy is one half hf. That means that the molecule is just gonna sit there and vibrate even when it's in its ground state. It's not going to cease vibrating. This is often called the zero point energy and there's a lot of repercussions for that. One of them is that that classical idea of molecular motion ceasing at zero Kelvin is not founded, right, for quantum mechanics. It doesn't actually happen. Things are still moving even at really low temperatures. So this is the zero point energy of the substance. Now, if you look at um, the energy level spectrum, what's happening is there's a selection rule, of course, so that the value of n can only change by at most one. So the selection rule says that delta n has to equal to plus or minus one, okay? Um, and if you plug it into that, then that means that, of course, for this expression E sub n, n plus one and half h bar omega, your energy levels are evenly spaced apart. All right, so that means that the energies between adjacent levels, the energies of the photon hopping from one level to another, or the energy of the photon that has to be absorbed to get the transition to go up, okay, then those are all equal, okay, and the energy of the photon will just equal to HF. Now, yet again, this can be violated if the energy is carried away by something else in the system, but for the most part, most of the time, these selection rules hold. Okay, now in general, a molecule is going to vibrate and rotate at the same time. It's going to be going all over the place, right? Okay, so if you wanted to look at the energy of the system, you would have to sum up the rotational and the vibrational spectrum. If you do that for a little diatomic molecule, this is what you get. N plus 1 half HF plus J times J plus 1 H bar squared over 2M REQ squared. I should probably note that your book uses a little shorthand notation so that it doesn't have to write this h bar squared over 2m req squared all the time, and it calls that value b, okay? I should also probably note that this m r squared bit, remember that's your moment of inertia i, so sometimes that gets subbed in too in your book and in the notes, okay? If you were to look at what would be going on inside of a molecule, referring to the transitions that photons can, uh, the photons that can be emitted, the transitions that the um, molecule can do, what's going to happen is both selection rules have to be satisfied simultaneously. So delta N has to equal to plus or minus one, and delta J has to equal to plus or minus one for any transition. Now it turns out that the energy separation between successive rotational levels is a lot smaller than between successive vibrational levels. So what you'll get in the spectrum, or if you look at the energy levels, is you'll see these J transitions, or these J energy levels, clustered around the allowed value for N there, okay? So here is the ground state vibrational value where N is equal to zero, and then here's your J values kind of clustered around that. And then here's a set of values where N is equal to one in the next highest first excited state in the vibrational spectrum, and then you can have that same J values for those values of the vibration, okay? And then transitions take place between, say, the J is equal to one state and the J is equal to two state for the next vibrational state. So all that can happen. Now, if you were to just take our theory and then plot out what you thought the molecular spectrum should look like, then you would see something like this. Okay, so here, this is your figure from your book, figure 931. This is HF, this is the vibrational energy of the photon, okay? But remember that your rotational states are also going to be kind of clustered around that. So you're going to be offset to the left and to the right um, from HF by your uh, rotational energy states, okay? So the photons are going to 
do all that there, okay? So on the right-hand side, you have delta n is equal to plus 1 and delta j is equal to plus 1, right? So that's its jumping up in rotational energy levels, okay? So here you've got 0 to 1 for j, here you've got 1 to 2 for j, and 2 to 3, and so on and so forth. And on the left-hand side, it's where delta j is equal to minus 1. So it's going from 1 to 0, or 2 to 1, or 3 to 2. It might help to go back to this um, diagram and make sure that you understand what's going on with it, okay? Now, the reality of what we expect to happen from that little line diagram and what actually happens is plotted here. This is the absorption spectrum of hydrogen chloride. All right, so what's going on here is you see a couple of things. First of all, instead of discrete lines, you've got peaks that have a certain width to them. We kind of already discussed that. This is going to be due to the resolution of your spectrometer, number one. It's going to have a certain uh, resolution to it so that what might be sort of delta functiony looking um, in real life gets spread out just due to your detector and it also has to do with the uncertainty principle you're just going to have a natural broadening of a spectral line due to that so instead of discrete delta functions you've got these peaks that have a set width to them okay so that's one thing now another thing is that you'll notice that each one of these peaks is actually two lines or two peaks superimposed on top of one another. Well, this is because there's different isotopes of chlorine. In fact, the isotopes are 35 molecular weight, 35 grams per mole, and then 37 grams per mole. There's two different isotopes of chlorine. What that does is it changes the reduced mass slightly for that, and that alters the energy levels. So that's why you see two peaks instead of just one peak. Okay, so you see the doublet. Now you might also notice that there's not just a whole bunch of peaks that are all the same height, right? It has this kind of hump shape to it. Okay, so what's up with that? Well, it turns out that the hump shape is due to a couple of things. First, your um, quantum angular momentum, J, there's different numbers of magnetic quantum numbers for each value of J, right? Just like in the um, angular momentum and in the spin angular momentum from the hydrogen atom and from the energy states in an atomic link scale, you've still gotten the magnetic quantum numbers for these guys. So you have different numbers of states available depending on your value of J because M sub J runs from minus J to plus J. Okay, so there's different numbers of states available, and that means that more transitions can occur for certain states. So that controls the height of the peak. Another thing that controls the height of the peak is how these available states are populated. All right, it turns out that um, higher energy states are going to be less populated than lower energy states. I mean, that makes sense if you think about it. Let's say that you're at room temperature. Okay, you can't expect a really high energy state to be populated at room temperature. And so you're going to have a factor in there called the Boltzmann factor that gives you the population of states for a given temperature T. Okay, and that's going to look vaguely like a decaying exponential on either side. Okay, so um, that's controlled here by this little function with this decaying exponential that depends upon J and the temperature. Okay. So if you take into account both of those factors, the population of states and the temperature dependence due to the Boltzmann factor, you multiply those together, then that's proportional to the intensity for your states, okay? And that's in good agreement with the envelope of the spectral lines that we saw for the absorption spectrum of hydrogen chloride. Okay, so to sum up, in this lecture, we've described rotational energy states and where they come from, vibrational energy states and where they come from, and then the combination of those two states to make up the absorption or emission spectrum of um, a certain substance. These spectra can act as fingerprints, so you can use them to identify certain molecules. Now this isn't to be confused with the higher energy spectra that you get from electrons that are bound to a specific atom. That's going to be in a different region of the electromagnetic spectrum, maybe the visible, maybe the UV, maybe the X-ray. This is going to be at different frequencies, okay, lower frequencies, lower energy states in the microwave region of the spectrum or somewhere like that. Okay, so you're going to use a different detector. It's a whole different ballgame. But the nice thing is that you're not just saying, hey, 
hey, there's chlorine here, you can actually identify a molecule. So you can say that it's hydrogen chloride, okay? And it acts as a fingerprint for a molecule or a substance that's not just an identification of the individual atoms that might be present. All right, so I hope that clears up some um, questions for you. And if you have further questions, don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you.